you are famous for doing an enormous amount of research. That kind of deep preparation is obviously, you obviously regard as totally essential. You put in a, a great deal more work than most Yeah, well, to know and to, to, to understand what the, the, the nature of the, of the behavior is or the situation or whatever. Just to, uh, it's like discovering what the person is about, what the character is about, what the situation is about, so that you can have uh, different things to choose from. I think truth is the keynote of all acting or of all artists. The fact that you wear a costume doesn't make any difference to your mind. And if your mind is truthfully playing the character you're supposed to be playing, the costumes and whether you have a fan in your hand or anything, it doesn't make any difference at all. But then the only interesting thing, I think, is to play as many different things as possible. I think typecasting and type acting is one of the menaces, really, because you get used to what somebody is going to do and then there, it holds no surprise for you. And if you're not going to be surprised in life, um, it's a pity, I think. I think people shouldn't appear too sure uh, of themselves because they probably aren't, as a rule. I only know that um, a star to me is somebody who makes me... Uh, feel that I don't understand quite what they're doing, but I feel there's a sort of magic about it. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure that falling in love with a character is the way to talk about what needs to happen, but what, there has to be some recognition when you first read the material that occurs at a level that's not from the neck up, a sort of a concord within your soul, something, a, a deep recognition of something you understand about this character that feels like you on some level, even if it's perfectly horrible. It's just, you recognize yourself somewhere. And then uh, that, that, that carries you in the great action of acting, which is be belief, you know, you're just trying to convince people you are who you say you are. What do I want from a director? Clarity and certainty. Even when they don't know what they, are not sure what they want. Just to convey that, to convey that they're not certain what it is that they want, but to convey that clearly. It's so important to feel that you can rest what you do as an actor, which is unravel, that it's going to all be in a safe kind of basket and that it'll be put together <clears throat> confidently by someone. When I read a script, I'll look at it through the lens of the character I'm playing, which I try to not to do. I try to just take it as an experience and like see the movie in my head. And I did when I read the script. I was like, I didn't look at it through the lens of the character. I just was. I want to be a part of this. I went back and read the script, and I went, oh shit, this is going to require a lot of like, heavy lifting. And I haven't exercised that muscle <laughs> in a while. If I didn't work, if my performance didn't work, the whole movie doesn't work. What makes you nervous or insecure? It's like, I don't know. It's a, that's an emotion I've gotten so comfortable with being an actor. It's like, we just all that way. It just yeah. keeps you on edge. I mean, there's, it can get to a place where it's an unhealthy thing. Like, you do want to be like, I'm ready. I'm prepared, I'm, I will be good, I want it to be good, I'll give you my everything. But sometimes you're just like, I'm a fraud. <laughs> and I don't know any actor that doesn't feel like that. Yeah. You know, we all feel like the imposter syndrome. But as an actor, you're like, am I gonna have it today? Mm. Am I gonna have that focus? Am I, that little flame inside of us that, you know, a little gust of wind comes by and can blow it out? Am I gonna be in tune with what's going, am I gonna be interesting? Am I gonna make the right choices? And my most nervous moment, is always a few days before I start work on something. Right. Because no decisions or no choices have been made yet to concrete what you're doing with that role. Once I start playing this character, like you're kind of in it. You're asking somebody to do something to sort of reach down to the depths of their soul and pull out their, their heart and, you know, leave it out there in this scene. And then they go, okay, hold on, cut. We got a light. We got to move a light. And like, <laughs> You know, and like, oh, that's lunch. Yeah. We're gonna break for lunch, and we're gonna come back. And, like, and you do get other takes, and you get other chances at it. But it really does. Uh, the people I marvel at the actors that that can just that have that focus, and they can just stay in it. Yes, they should be able to. I think they should be able to if they are trained actors. I personally resent. <laughs> oh my God, this is how we start the interview. I personally resent the film and TV actor coming to Broadway 
messing with the economics of the stage actor and bombing. Yeah. And bombing on Broadway because they don't have the chops, they don't have the technique. Stage acting is considerably different. The discipline is different than um, television and film acting, and, and you need you need to train for it, even if it's just going to the gym to work up some sort of stamina for eight shows a week. And I think that if you're a trained stage actor, it is easy for, easier for you to adapt to television and film. It's a question of larger or smaller. But I also think it's it's not the way it used to be, where everything was in one city. The way it is in London, for instance, you can go, you can be on stage at night and shoot something during the day. Here you have to, unless it's shooting in New York, you have to fly to Los Angeles. I was never typecast anyway because I kept moving between a musical and a play or a, a TV movie and a musical and a play. First of all, you go into it, one, an actor should, I, go into it without the fear of the other actor's performance. And I'm only responsible for the text. I just think that if you don't have the fear, you can't lose. When you're frightened and nervous uh, in, in this chair, or you're distressed or uncomfortable, or you're very angry, and you know that that is not what is necessary to what cannot be shown here. You control your face. You're a highly controlled person. The dialogue changes, it. but the motivation doesn't. Are you motivation... saying that I could play any role you can play as well as you can? That might not be true, but I don't think that that uh, I could play some roles as well as you could play them. I don't think I could play the role that you're playing now. But this is me. I'm letting it all hang out. No, it's not me. <laughs> and you're thinking of 60 things at once. How is it going? Is it getting dull? Is he, is he upset and distressed and inarticulate? Is he, uh, uh, is he bored? Is he offended? Uh, yeah, here's a good time for a joke. We haven't got much time. That you, you're thinking about nine million things and reacting to what I say. And is that how's that going to be? Is that going to be offensive? No, that's good. So you're doing this, this editing at an insane rate, and you have to do that. And that's your job. And you have this demeanor of levity and lightness and uh, amusement and zest, it's easy to ascertain that that finally isn't what goes on in your mind or your feelings at all. I just feel like all my clothes have been taken off. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, that's something that I couldn't do. I couldn't do what you do. That's yeah. a different kind of acting. You're playing a different kind of role. But anyway, we've, we've done enough. We've made enough concessions. Probably a part of the puzzle that you don't know is for many years, and I continue to do it, but I had a theater company. I was not a cinema guy at all. So I would really venture out from this theater company that I used to work with and do films, but in a very sporadic way. And it wasn't driven by career. It was driven by sort of adventure and pleasure. In the beginning, I just wanted to be around interesting people and do interesting things. And I think that led me to a kind of pleasure of mixing it up, working in different kinds of movies and um, playing different kinds of roles. I think there are certain through lines that go through my choices. I think whatever helps you start from zero each time is really great. So if you can find those things that you're actually excited and you're actually curious about, then no matter what happens in the movie, you're okay. You'll you'll survive it. You'll you'll be healthy artistically, and uh, it'll be uh, a positive experience. Theater is very important, just for me, my own pleasure. Broadly speaking, you know, films are like uh, if you take a musician uh, that records only in the studio. If that's films, then playing in the theater is like playing in a bar band. It's a little more immediate. Uh, there's less cushion. You don't get flabby. Um, you make your own rhythms. I, I think it's important for me anyway. When you have a sense of direction, it's almost a momentum. And like, okay, I don't know how far the road is, but I think for finally I'm on the right, I'm on the right path. And um, a lot of people don't find their path, and I felt like I was lucky to do it. It doesn't ensure any measure of success, just knowing what you want to do, because a lot of people want to run in the Olympics, but they're not fast enough to run in the Olympics. You know what I mean? You want to be successful in this business, but are you willing to learn how it works? And, and are you trying to get better? That's what I try to do. Now, all these people are the playwright you're going to deal with. We're not going to deal with the program, lady. Get yourself away. Let us deal with you 
as material, not as an evolved people. You are material. Mostly I can play this play, I can play that play, I can understand that man and this man. One thing I don't want to understand is Stella all day long when she's doing this and that. I don't need her. I need her in two and a half hours when she's concentrated as a third sex or she is defeated or she is a woman that wants to become like Nora or so, wants to become like something. I don't need this Stella. Do you understand? Material, a blackboard, people write on me, yes? That's what you are. Will you stop it with yourself? I don't know if I told you and maybe it's wrong to say it. When a guy said to me, I'm, well, I'm a guy like Hamlet. I said, I don't think so. I said, Hamlet owned Denmark. And you don't have a pot to piss in. I have loved drag queens since I was in high school. I think they're, it's one of the most joyful, irreverent, funny, fantastic uh, sources of entertainment. We've been doing it since we've been telling stories. It's since the beginning of time. This Y is, I always said that was my drag. When I first started doing stand-up, I could not do it as myself. I didn't even understand how to do it. I'm not shy, but I could not go on in front of people. I also didn't know how to tell a story as myself. I truly was like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know how to do it. But I went out as Miss Y and I had like a LeMay coat on and a huge wig and crazy makeup and crazy jewelry and like sparkle tights. And I went on as Miss Y and then I could tell any story I wanted to. So it gave me that facade and that armor that I needed to, to go out and, and be, be who I wanted to be for that night. She's a, she's a full three dimensional character like any great character would be. And the, and the more time I spent with her, I really thought about she's incredibly funny. She's incredibly manipulative. I also thought about how damaged she is and that her family has thrown her aside and ostracized her. I thought about her not having the opportunity to have kids. Did she want kids? Also two years in isolation with the pandemic was quite the research I didn't need, but I got before doing somebody who's been living in isolation. I think her mental health came into to play. I think all of these things of like, what do you do if you've been isolated from the people that you love? And, and it's, it's not usually a good result. Mine kind of started to crash about my ears when I was about 17. Mm. And I guess that my, what happened was that my, instead of being a long, thin voice, my voice began to mature and kind of, you know, yeah. Uh, sure. The whole yeah. gimmick by the time I was 17 was that I was this fantastically incredible high singer. And yeah. uh, when I started to lose them, I thought, you know, I might as well take my life. You know, there was nothing else left. Really? You were that sad about it? Well, that? no, that worried because I was committed to shows and I was expected to sing. And when you suddenly can't, I, it was, I was kind of worried. Looking back on it, I suppose there were rough times, but you never think at the time that they're rough. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I was allowed all sorts of privileges that other kids were not and uh, I mean I was allowed to go into the theatre and I was allowed to watch from the side of the stage and, and get involved in it all and I felt I was the luckiest girl in the world. Uh, I guess I did miss out on a few things. I didn't have that many chums of my own age and things like that. And I didn't have much schooling. And, uh, you didn't? No, I, no, I had a kind of spasmodic schooling until I was about 12 when I did start working professionally and then I had a governess who, God bless him, tutored me and taught me anything I might know. People said that the people in the theatre were terrible and evil and, and I ought to watch out and I never found a soul that was really mean to me. People never hurt puppies and I guess when I was really young uh, they never mm -hmm. thought to hurt me either. So opening night, Simon and Garfunkel are at the after party. <laughs> oh, it's, it's insane. Paul Simon's talking to my mom and I, I walk over and he's saying to my mother, Listen, Artie and I didn't have as much fun as we could have had with our success. Encourage her to enjoy everything that's happening because it's all brand new and she should have a good time. Tell her it's okay. There's gonna come a time when they're gonna come after you for going to things and having fun and being brand new and being curious about everything. He said, don't ever let anyone take this away from you, ever. He said, because this only happens once. This time only happens once. I remember the people who were doing the press and we're walking down the street. She said, I'm gonna say this to you, 
because show's about to open. But this is the last time you're gonna be able to walk down the street like this. This is the end of that because once they find out about you, it's gonna change everything. It changed everything, but not the way I thought it was gonna change it. Because you know, when you're, when you're starving, artist you you say to your friends or whatever whoever makes it first brings everybody else through whoever makes it arranges that and my friends didn't wait for me to change they changed so it became about oh you have different friends now it's like no we're they're new friends that was the first traumatic thing it is again the complete need to give what is your life to another person and to be able to say it is to say what you will leave me is not a lie i have given it to you i just want you to know i have given you what is my life and that's what you get at the ceremony that it does by taker and you know and you know forever and for all that it is very beautiful biblically but it doesn't sound good because it's always repeated from somebody else's mouth but he said I have given you my life. That's something that I'd like you to be able to do in a love scene, if you have one. Instead of pushing and pressing, I'm an American, see, I love that. No, in most of the play that you will get, you will see how in depth the relationships are, but you have no point of reference to it. And I want you to have a point of reference in history that there is in man the ability to say, if I don't give my life to you, I haven't lived. That is the ability the author gives you to be able to make man capable, therefore, of creating through this giving away a child. And then you can go on with this and that and the other. But there is nothing bigger than his sense of creation. Do you follow me? Okay.